I have talked too long. We'll get down, get down to the business of trying some of this. So you know what I am talking about. Otherwise, it will remain a lecture, not a workshop. <coughs> but I would like to give you time for questions at this time on what I have explained. Yes. Shabad can be heard first. Yes. It can sometimes be heard and not heard. Have you ever seen, uh, uh, had this phenomenon of hearing and not hearing? We sometimes refer to it as white sound. You can have a sound which is so continuously going, you don't hear it. If you put attention, you can hear it. It's there. So that happens sometimes. Any question at this time on what I have said so far? Yes. If I gave an answer, this friend will say you are very clever. <laughs> the truth is that we are going into a reality through concepts. Those concepts fit in with our understanding here. They may not fit in anywhere else. But since we have to make a start from here, they must fit in with our understanding here. Therefore, we use all these devices to describe something that is really indescribable. For example, if there is consciousness that is not conscious of anything, we don't have any word in any vocabulary yet to describe it. Therefore, we say, if it is consciousness as we know consciousness, it has to be conscious of something. If there is a creator, you can't call it creator. I am using it because of feminists here, otherwise I say he. <clears throat> a creator cannot be a creator without a creation. Otherwise, how does the name creator come? Create what? So, if there is uh, no creation, there could be a creator, but we will have to find another name. So long as we call it creator and he has created something, then we have to say creator, creation must go together. Also, we, be, we believe, and there is a concept here, that the creator cannot be less than what he creates. So, if we have something, the creator must have it. It is not likely that we are conscious creation here, we are all conscious as part of creation, and the creator is unconscious. It doesn't sound plausible. Our existing Logic and our existing system of understanding will not permit it. Therefore, we say if we are conscious, creator has to be conscious. And if creator is total, he must be totally conscious. If he is totally conscious, then all our consciousness must be part of him. Therefore, all of us must be part of him. So, a conscious creator who is also total, if you give these three words, creator, conscious, total, must include everything that has ever been created. There can be nothing left outside. So these very words also show that whatever we are experiencing or can experience possibly is covered by that kind of a creator, a conscious total creator. So the very words we are using ties us down to these attributes. It may, it may be possible when we reach there, we find some other attributes we didn't have words. And we will say, creator, why did you not tell us? He says, you didn't know my language. He said, no, I taught you that language way back. Why didn't you use it? He says, what language did you teach me? I only learnt English and French and German. But I taught you language of love. Did you forget it? At least that language ran right through in all the stages. Yes, second question. The, the reason for this workshop and the reason for the seeking of truth is different for different people. But for a majority of people, maybe about 95 percent, sometimes I am conservative in saying 95, but maybe 99 percent, is to escape from the misery and unhappiness of this creation. They are unhappy. They want to find something more lasting by way of joy and happiness. That is why we brought the, the question of happiness last evening. But there are a few rare exceptions who are not bothered by happiness or unhappiness. They want to find the truth anyway. Even if it is happiness or unhappiness, some fear that the truth may be extreme unhappiness. They are willing to go into it. Some are afraid that having reached the ultimate, we may find the cause of all creation, loneliness, and find out why the creator was compelled in spite of his freedom, in spite of his consciousness, in spite of his being creator, how he was compelled to create just to overcome his own loneliness. But there are some people who don't care. They say, we want to find out the truth, whatever it is. 
but they start off by finding out the truth of the creator and end up by finding the truth of themselves. It's a nice journey. People do it for different motives. I personally would like to do it both for happiness and for truth. And I can only tell you from my experience, more than half a century after experimenting, after initiation, I have experienced it now for nearly 54 years. What I have been explaining to you personally, and I can only vouch that this path does give much greater happiness than we can find anywhere else in the world. I can also tell you this path gives you an awareness of the self that nothing else can give, no kind of intellectual discussion or intellectual introspection can give. Whether you are looking for the truth about yourself or you are looking for happiness, this is it. And if you find something better than this, I will take it. Anybody who can show me something better than this, I am willing to go and take it. Yes. All right, I can give you a little. Yeah. No, no, don't get past. I'll tell you a little modified solution to your problem. A little modification. I don't know how many will agree with me, but they can if they want to. If you chase after money, it seems to run. You don't win lottery. Most of the people who won lottery say we never tried. We are not persistent lottery players. We just bought by chance. My friends pressed me to buy a ticket. It looks like when you chase people, they also run away. The more you chase, the more they run away. The more you chase money, the money seems to run away. But if you are happy, money chases you and so, does pe so do people. So why not start the other way around? Be happy and let money and people chase you. You will get what you want. <laughs> yes. Yes, in different stages we had had different lives. Again we will ha be having. In every phase of the different yugas, different era, uh, we have had different lifespans. But uh, I don't know if you would prefer to have a fast life, all the goodies, enjoy yourself, ride fast cars, go on airplanes, go to the space, to the moon, and have a good time, eat night pizza available nowadays. Or go back and sit for 100 years in a cave without any pizzas and cars. I don't know what you would prefer. But the fact that uh, chronologically there was more time available in different periods uh, is, uh, is true. But it doesn't, it doesn't mean they lived more. They lived longer. But need not have lived more. I think the one who can have spiritual experiences within at will, not by accident, at will, has the best life, has the maximum to live. That one man can live the most. Yes, you have a second question. I don't know in what sense they use it. If the spirit, some people use the spirit, like they say, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, the Trinity. In Trinity, they speak of the Holy Spirit, not as the individuated soul, but as the third factor that links God and man. In that form, the spirit is more close to the word that I described. And soul is the individuated form which we say makes us conscious. But except for this distinction, I would use the word spirit and soul wherever it is. They can mean the same thing too. Yes. No, it's a withdrawal experience. It is different from passive and from active. The experience, now you have that those three lights on the wall. You look at it, it's an active experience of looking at those lights. Your attention goes there. You can sit passively, not be active and just keep on looking at them. It's a passive experience of just watching the wall. Attention is still there, passively. Attention in both cases is outside. Attention is riveted on the experience, sensory experience taking place, whether actively or passively around you. Therefore, it is not withdrawal. When I say withdrawal of attention to yourself, I am referring to withdrawing attention to where the self is operating from. The sound comes from the self. Therefore, it is the same as withdrawal and not placing on something. The sound is the manifestation, if we call it, of the self, not of a creation. It is the sound of creator. 
not of the creation. Therefore, when we follow that sound, the inner sound, it is following the self. And it's easy to withdraw when you hear the sound. It's difficult to withdraw without hearing the sound as we will follow later on in this workshop. Yes? No. It does not mean for one to be happy, you must make somebody unhappy or have somebody unhappy. It only means to experience happiness, you must also know what is unhappiness. Yes. The question is, <clears throat> we have responsibilities in this world to our family, to others, and we have to have many kinds of relationships here, do our jobs properly, and then we are trying to go within and seek happiness there. What is the correlation between the two? How should we do the family duties and the worldly duties at the same time try to practice going within and find real happiness? That's the question. That's, I came up to the microphone because this may be a question others would like to answer. Anybody else wants to have an answer to this question? Sure. That's why I came here. The answer given by the great master to a similar question might be relevant here. He said that the mind has two parts called the outer mind and the inner mind, which he called Nijman, the mind behind the mind. And the Nijman, the mind behind the mind, is more relevant for spiritual growth than the outer mind. If you want to do your worldly duties, use the outer mind and its attention to work outside, but the inner mind, the mind behind the mind, which loves to think of those you love, even when you are doing something else, that mind should be tied down to inner meditation. He gave the example of a housewife cooking in the kitchen, a mother cooking in the kitchen and preparing food, and the little child is playing in the next room, and the little child, if the mother was fully putting her attention of the whole mind on the cooking, the child cried, she wouldn't know. But there is some part of her, even if the child cries a little, she will leave the cooking to run and take the child. So she is using her mind, an outer part of the mind, to do the day-to-day -day work, an inner mind for the one she loves. In the same way, we should, when working in this world, do a thoroughly good job, and in the inside, remember the Lord, remember the Master. Remember the truth and say, try to see if everything that you do kicks up a memory of that. It's a way of life. A meditator who is on the spiritual path very quickly finds out how when something happens, thank you, man. Thank you, God. You did it, I know. What a coincidence. This is all being done to outside duties of the world. We are doing our outside duties to people, to our jobs, and as they go on, we say secretly, nobody knows. I got it done because the Lord helped me. What part is saying the Lord helped me and what part is doing it? The two parts of the mind. And we have to use the two parts. If one does not know how to distinguish between the two parts, learn to thank the Lord for every good thing that happens around. If you start thanking the Lord, quietly in the back of your head. Every time something good happens to you, you learn to distinguish between the two parts. If a bad thing happens, then thank the God for, as I said, nothing worse happens. If the worst happens, say it's not the worst. If the worst happens, fight with the Lord. Why did you do it? When I get time off from this, I'll ask you. But keep in communication with the Lord. When you keep in communication, the back of your head, that's the mind that helps. You can do your duties well. In fact, duties should be done so thoroughly that there is nothing to pull you back towards duty. If you do not do your duty in the stage in which you are placed, it is like saying, okay, I don't want to do this. I am on a spiritual path. What you did not do will pull you back again and again from the spiritual path. If you ignore what you ought to do in this world, the ignoring of your duty will pull you back as much as any entanglement elsewhere. Therefore, one must do one's duty fully. Having done it, thank God for letting me do it. It's over. 
Now I am on the spiritual path. Use the two parts of the mind for the two purposes for which they are created. Yes. Uh, the closest personality of God that we can come to in physical world is the physical human being. The physical human being is created in the closest proximity and similarity to God. If you went and found God, you would find God more similar than a human being than any other being ever created, including all the angels and spirits. Therefore, this human form is the closest to the form of God and made in His image. This is the form that is made in His image. This is the form in which you can find that real image. This is the only form in which you can uh, do what I said earlier, to find the truth. I know of no other form in which truth can be found. This is the form and what is the strongest similarity between this form and the ultimate form of the creator? The strongest similarity is not in the eyes or the nose or the form itself. The strongest resemblance between God and this form is this form uses free will like that form does. No other form does. The experience of free will is confined to only these two. The creator and the human being. That's what brings human being closest to that ultimate reality. Any other question? Yes. But uh, whatever language we use, even if we evolve a new language, the trouble with language is that any language that we speak anywhere on this planet or have ever spoken has been based upon sound with connotation based upon association of ideas. We have never had any other way to develop language. Language everywhere in every culture has been built upon the use of sound associated with the imagery and the sensory perception that we are having. Therefore, that's a weakness in language itself. Therefore, the best language one can speak sometimes is be quiet. Not to speak. Sometimes you communicate more by not speaking. When you want to speak, maybe you, you communicate more. And if we look at our own lives, I don't know, George, about you, but I can tell you, very often I have felt, if I had not spoken, I would be much better off. But there are times when you have to speak, then you speak up. But most of the time, we chatter and jabber and we waste a lot of time. We waste a lot of energy. In all kind of idle talk, we start commenting upon the state of this world and how bad it is. We talk about politics. We talk about bad things happening and the great things, bad things happening in history. And we comment upon it, unable to do anything to it. And we waste so much of energy and time. What good is it? What good have we made of that language? We didn't use language to any great benefit. But there are some words one can use to one's benefit. For example, when one is initiated by a perfect living master, he gives us some words, mantra, to repeat. He says, repeat these words, they are serving a purpose. The principal purpose they serve, as we can know it now, here is, the principal purpose of repeating certain words during meditation is to keep the mind busy. Instead of speaking something else, it starts speaking what it is directed to speak. And if what it is directed to speak, it can keep on speaking, it can give us some free time to listen to the sound. We can become listeners by speaking certain kind of words. Those words are worthwhile. But they may be Sanskrit or Greek or Arabic or English, doesn't matter. Yes. Music is the closest I can think of. The sound. If you can listen to a sound intently, if your ear and inner ear is trained to listen to sound. That's great. So why not listen to the sound? It's a good alternative to speaking. I think the best alternative to speaking is listening to the sound within. Go sit in a quiet place, in a quiet corner. Nobody is disturbing you. Put out the light. Sit there quietly and listen. You'll hear the sound. They conducted a strange experiment. I don't know if you are familiar with it. They have built a soundproof chamber, a completely soundproof. Any sound, even if a bomb 
explodes outside it's absorbed by the walls which are consisting of certain material they have used and no sound can come inside so they have put the man and no man can sit there for more than 5 minutes they say even after 5 minutes he has a hard time getting back into normal life he's so crazy did you ever realize that we are living on all extraneous noises and that is what makes us sane that if all extraneous noises around us were suddenly shut off and we were placed in a real quiet place we would get insane now what happened to those people they got insane because they began to hear their heartbeat they began to hear the blood in their vessels they began to hear very loudly all these simple physical sounds that were taking place in them which they never listened to before quietness is a great thing but if you went on the spiritual path and went into astral stages you will also find that this world is resting for its existence in its form on noise and noise is different from sound and the noise is what keeps us outside and the sound takes us inside and therefore if you can find a reasonably quiet place i don't say completely quiet place a reasonably quiet place because if it is completely quiet you will just hear your heart thumping you say something has gone wrong with my heart i'm going to die that's what happened to those scientists if you have find a reasonably quiet place some little bird can chirp once in a while some little water can flow in the pipe and doesn't bother you some little white sound is around which doesn't bother you in that kind of a quiet place you sit sit quietly and say is there something coming from within me you will hear the sound beautiful mellow it's it's like so many birds singing together it's like a screen of sound flowing down it's like waterfall and bird and movement and some strange float under all these are going on together and yet these are practice sounds these are sounds that are still a relationship to the physical body as you listen to them more intently you begin to hear a sh- slightly shrill sound like little bell ting 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 somewhere in the back they come and go you feel the sound is coming and going actually your attention is wavering you put your attention on that it becomes louder and that itself leads you to the sound of the bell dong 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 is going on all the time it's all within each one of us that's the secret stop speaking any language and listen to the sound yes there are many ways of measuring progress one of the ways of measuring progress is how much peace have you got is that the title of the workshop <laughs> how much peace have you got what is peace you say inner peace people want happiness and the second word second hot favorite word is peace they want peace in the mind and peace in the world now they've also accepted if people have peace in themselves there will be peace in the world how do you get peace inside the peace can be measured by the degree of reduction of the five negative energies or negative experiences that we get through the senses which you know kaam krodh lobh moh ahankar lust anger attachment greed ego use these as a test are these five very high you haven't made much progress are these getting lower is progress is one being lowered at the expense of another not much progress are they all getting low fine this could be one of the measures the other measure is purely a spectacular measure that you fly and you see the lights and you travel and you and you meet your perfect living master inside like you met outside and you have a companion to talk to at all times that's another measure and then you fly from stage to stage and as the revelation of your own reality keeps coming that's another measure it's good when we are still outside to measure from those five perversion yes at every level that i have spoken of while we are here we have a relationship to this body and every body that we experience every vehicle that we experience has a relationship to this body in some way this is the most precious treasure we have you can call it beloved i would rather have a different kind of beloved more long lasting 
this is too temporary. It may have all these facilities and greatness to temporary. I like a more long lasting beloved. But I still say it's the most precious treasure a human being has while he is human, the human body through which he can get all the experience, including the experience of the beloved. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this second part of the workshop in which I would like to share with you the techniques that we follow in order to practice the withdrawal of attention. The full techniques are taught by perfect living masters when they initiate their disciples. When one is ready, one meets the master. If somebody wants to know what the address of the master is, the address is in their own heart. You be ready in your own heart, by coincidence, you will run into a master. I have seen that happen over and over again. So I can give you no other address except it is in, in your own heart to find the perfect living man. Be ready there, not outside. Don't tell anyone. Be ready and wait for coincidences and miracles to happen. They happen even today. And you will by coincidence run into a perfect living master. And when you are ready, he will initiate us. When we are ready, he initiates us. Initiates us by making our inner attention, the potential attention we have to go backward, attached to the naam, the word, the shabad, the sound. So, a perfect living master introduces us to the royal road right at the time of initiation. Initiation by other masters is different. This is not a ritual. We don't even know if we are initiated. We can be initiated by a perfect living master and not know till much later when we go within and find we were initiated at that time, when we were connected to the inner sound. So initiation by a perfect living master opens the door. Of course, after initiating to the sound current, the master also tells us what practices to follow to go to the railroad station where we will catch the train or the airport from where we will fly. The inner journey is in the company of the perfect living man. Once we reach there, we have the actual company, like we talk to each other here, we can talk to the master there, and the entire journey and all the stages I mentioned to you earlier take place in the company of the master. The great thing, the best deal one can have on this planet or anywhere else in the universe that I know of. Nobody has told me of a better deal. I am ready for a better deal. When I was initiated by the great master in India, he told me, I have shared with you what I got from my master. That's what he said to me. And it's the best thing I have got. Nobody has been able to give me anything better. Ishwar Puri, go forth and find out if there is anything better. If you find something better than this, go and take it. Don't come back to ask for my permission. First go and take that which is better, then come back and tell me so I may also go and take it. These are the instructions of my master to me. And I am still looking around with open mind, with open heart. I have gone around the world. I didn't know I will travel so much after that. I have gone around the world so many times, maybe 30, 40 times, and been to so many countries and met hundreds of thousands of people and met thousands of masters and heard about hundreds of different paths, different forms of yoga, different forms of practices. Actually practice them to see if I am understanding it fully or not. Gone into the six chakras, aroused the kundalini, gone into other energy centers, and done all kind of different things. I need not narrate all the details of these practices. Suffice to say, not only did I not find anything surpassing this particular method that the great master gave me, I did not even find anybody describing it adequately. Therefore, I was very happy. I am still happy. But if I find something better, I will take it. If you find something better, take it and give me also. I will give you my address. The point is, 
we want to go within our mind does not let us go within. how do we handle this? that's the first step we want to go within the mind doesn't let us go within let's start step by step we want to go within that means we want to have control over our attention attention that is going out we want to hold it back to ourselves withdraw it how do we do it that's the first part withdrawing of attention is to find out where we are and only think about that where we are not go anywhere that will lead to withdrawal where are we practice tells us and practice will tell you if we sit quietly with our eyes closed without adopting any unusual hatha yoga posture or any other yogic posture sit peacefully comfortably as comfortably as possible that we don't get distracted by the discomfort of our body not so comfortably lie down that we go to sleep that's the best posture if one wants to know what is the best posture for meditation or yoga the best posture is so comfortable that no discomfort on your body draws your attention to the discomfort and it is not so comfortable that you go to sleep and forget what you are doing sitting upright we do it cross legged in india but that's the normal method a so chair you can sit chair comfortably sitting upright not going to sleep not slouching but upright but not too tight not up tight if you can make that posture you are already in a correct posture for meditation and for going within so if you adopt this the next step is how to have control over your attention there are many practices by which one can assume control over attention i'll do a few little exercises with you to help you develop control over your own attention i want that you should be able to use attention at a sensory level which is the next higher level at the astral level use that sensory perception independent of the organs of sense on this body so that you should be able to feel that you can see you can hear you can touch you can taste you can smell only by being there not by having something with you so the first exercise we are going to do is to sit in a comfortable position and go back behind the eyes to the third eye center this location of wakeful consciousness has been called the third eye center or the center or the seat of consciousness the seat of the soul many words have been used i represent it like this if the fingertips of my hand represents the two eyeballs like they in a triangle come to the middle just like this behind these eyes behind these eyes sitting like this in the center center of the head is the third eye center if you can figure out where it is be there if you cannot figure out just try to figure out where you are just find out for yourself this is one way of doing it the second way of doing it is think there are two straight lines vertical lines i mean horizontal lines going back from the eye and think there is one line cutting between the two ears like this two eye lines are coming like this and one line is going like this between the ears figure out where that line is intersecting these two lines sit in the middle of that here are two lines is one line between the ears take that line and sit on the top of it imagine that you are sitting there use imagination to localize yourself when you imagine you are there you are really putting your attention to yourself yes no the ears from which you hear you don't touch the ears and see just feel where you hear from they'll be aligned if you feel that ears are lower slant it <laughs> it'll come out right these are these are just directions why if you go slightly a few millimeters off it will make no difference the difference comes when you go off by 6 inches or more which means outside either way so long as you are within the periphery you will come back to the center 
imagine. Now this is use of imagination. Imagine you are sitting there, you are there. Doesn't matter in what form, what body, what maybe same body. You are sitting there in the middle of the head. Imagine you are there. And what are you doing there? You are doing nothing but imagining that you are there. That's the first exercise. Once you are sure, you can use your hand to figure out, am I really there? Is my hand hitting behind? Yeah, I am in front of this. Am I behind this? Yes. Am I in the middle? Yeah, I can feel it. Am I somewhere in the middle? Use your hand to determine your location in the center of the head at the third eye center. If you are conscious of your own location, you cannot go wrong. You forget all the lines. You will be there. Because actually you are there. I am not saying go there. I am saying you are there. What is taking you out is your attention. You are always there in the wakeful state. When we are awake, we are there. Why we are trying to do this exercise is to withdraw attention from other things. This exercise of ourselves trying to recognize where we are, withdraws attention to where we are. So, imagine you are there. When you are able to imagine you are there, you will find there is space all around you. In the head and around. There is space, darkness. When the space will come around you, just sit there, do nothing. Keep on concentrating on being there, not on something. But some things may come in front of you. Some images, some little blobs of light, color, they may come. Just move along as if on a screen. If they come, don't follow them. Because the moment you start following them, you are no longer on your own third eye center. Stay there and watch them. Stay there and watch them pass. Let them go. Yes. Doesn't matter what you look like. Yes, you can take a chair. You can take a mat. You can just sit on the rope. You can take the best chair you like. It costs nothing today. Pardon? You can take the human form. You don't, you don't uh, go very much into the form. You find out what form you are. Just go and be there and say, if I am in the center of the head, what form do I have? Are my legs dangling? Is the chair, chair too tall? May I make it short? It's imagination. Take a comfortable chair and sit on it. Take the most comfortable chair you can find and sit on it. When you have sat on the chair, I will keep on giving you the directions as we go along. Sat on the chair, then imagine that next to your chair on the right side is a small table, very beautiful table. On that, you have some flowers sitting there in a vase. Pretty vase, pretty flowers, and there is a small plate with some nice goodies. I don't know, it's ice cream or cake or or cookies or what, there's some nice things to eat. It has your most favorite food, your most favorite dessert. Whatever you like is sitting there. And when you are sitting there and you know you are there, you will pick up the flowers, look at them, smell them and put them back. You will pick up the dessert, use the knife or spoon that goes on the plate, eat it and put it back. And when this, this exercise has been done, we'll open our eyes on the count of five and review what happened and why did it happen that way. Simple exercise. You are ready? Any questions? Okay. Sit in upright position comfortably. Close your eyes and withdraw your attention to behind the eyes at the third eye center and figure out where you are. See? Figure out where you are. Don't try to be somewhere. Figure out where you are. Where are the eyes? Where are the ears? Where is the head? How high is your hair? How high is the scalp? Can you figure out where the throat is? Figure out, are you really behind the eyes? Just experience that for yourself. If you are too far behind, pull your chair in front. If you are too much in front, push the floor and move back. Don't go below the eyes. 
behind the eyes. Don't go to sleep. Keep awake. Whatever comes in front, ignore it. Just watch it and let it pass. Any faces that you see, any images, let them pass. Don't follow them. Stay in the center. Now feel your chair and see how it feels to sit in your chair inside. See if you have an imaginative table on your right. Look at the table. Does it have the flowers? Look closely and see the flowers. Imagine there are flowers sitting there. Pick up the flowers. Bring them in front of you. Watch the flowers. Look at the color. Look at the form. Is it changing? Watch it carefully. Smell them. Put them back on the table. Look at the table if the sweet dessert has come. Take it up and try and eat it. See how it tastes. Put it back. Put the plate back on the table. Keep sitting in the chair. Keep your eyes closed till I count five. One, two, three, four, five. Open your eyes. Look this side. Open your eyes. Look this side. Did anybody have uh, uh, actually feeling of sitting in a chair in the third eye center? Please raise your hand. Those who felt they were able to sit on the chair. Did anybody have difficulty finding the chair or third eye center? Yes. You were in front. Okay. With practice, you can push back. Yes. You don't have to see anything. How many of you saw flowers? What flower did you see? I made did you smell them? Mind was wandering. That's the exercise. How the mind wanders to pick up the sensory experiences. Yes. So you picked up carnation and put back roses. Okay. Yes. What colors? Pinks and greens. Good. Fragrance was good. What was the fragrance like? Relate to any particular flower? No. Okay. Any particular perfume? No. Was it new? You haven't had that before? Okay. Okay. Any other experience with flowers you want to share? Yes. What color? Was it pretty? Has anybody seen any flowers today they have never seen in life before? Yes. What, what kind of flower? Big flower? You mean like a, like a cauliflower? <laughs> any other flower seen to share with? Yes. Rays coming out from the center of the daisy, around the daisy. You try to smell with this nose. They don't smell with this nose, right? Okay, let's move on to the dessert. Did anybody eat anything good? Please raise your hands if you really got dessert to eat. Okay, let's share what dessert you got. You want to share? Brownies. Did they taste good? Were they like the brownies you normally have? Okay. Anybody in the food business take note of the recipes coming up? <laughs> okay. Ladies and gentlemen, what have we done in this exercise? We have done nothing but to explore how attention can use memory and imagination to have experiences which cover the experience of seeing, touching, tasting, smelling, hearing. It is the point we were making was not what we saw, what we touched, what we tasted. The point being made was that our consciousness has the capacity either by going into memory or imagination or fantasy to recreate the sensory perceptions we think are tied down to the physical organs of sense, which is not true. The physical organs of sense are not necessary to have any of these sensory experiences. That was the whole purpose. We gave a very small part of our attention to this exercise. Very small. So, although we tasted and we did this, but the attention that we diverted was so little, it's still an imaginative exercise. If more of attention is diverted, that becomes as real, in fact, more real than what's happening now, even the workshop. This is real because of attention. 
This body is real because of attention. The more attention we put into anything, that becomes real. The sensory perceptions are not what are creating our knowledge of reality. The attention that flows to pick up the sensory perceptions creates reality. Now, this was just an experiment to show the nature of attention and its relationship with sensory perception. We will now do the standard orange juice exercise. How many of you have already done it? You don't mind doing it again? Okay. There are a lot of them. Has anybody never done the orange juice exercise? Okay. There are some newcomers. This exercise is now designed to see if we can move attention at will where we like. Not only that we have uh, attention that creates, recreates sensory perception, can we move it around? In this exercise, we shall assume that our body is made of glass, like a jar, an odd shaped, human shaped jar, all empty inside. Only the outside is made of glass and very strong glass, of course. If you hit too much, hard, it will break. So, you have to be careful not to move the jar too much, which means in this exercise, don't move about the body, the jar will crack. Now, this empty jar is actually filled up or you will fill up with orange juice and fill it up right to the top with orange juice, right to the head that means. All the arms, fingers, hands, everything has to be filled up with orange juice so that the whole body made of glass is filled up with orange juice and the only exits available to drain the orange juice are in the fingertips in the nails and in the toes of the feet. So, when you press the finger, the valves open and let the orange juice go out. If you do not press, leave it relaxed, it is full, it is closed. So, in order for the orange juice to move out, you have to use pressure on your fingers. If you use pressure, the orange juice starts going out, flowing out. In which case, if the orange juice starts flowing out, you know it is going out starting from the head. By gravity, it is going down. The exercise consists of regulating the flow of orange juice in this imaginative exercise so that you know where the orange juice level is. So, when I will start this exercise, you will imagine that your bodies are made of glass, fill them up with juice, make sure it is filled right to the top and then I will guide you on the gradual release of the orange juice by pressing first your fingertips and when the orange juice has gone below the arms, then pressing the toes. So, the toes then start releasing this and at different points, I will ask you to stop. So, that is not involuntary. For example, I will ask you to stop when the level reaches the eyes. When you find that your level has reached the eyes, you must stop till I ask you to go ahead further. When it reaches the nose, you must again stop. When it reaches the throat, again stop and so on. I will keep on telling you when to stop and when to start the flow of orange juice again till the body is vacated. Then we will review the exercise. Okay, be ready. Assume an upright position, comfortable so you do not get distracted by the body, not so comfortable that you go to sleep. Close your eyes. Imagine that your body is made of glass and fill it up now with orange juice and make sure, look over all the body, that the feet, legs, hands, arms, body, torso, head, face, everything is filled up with orange juice. When you are ready, raise your arms and lower it, so I know it. Fill up the body completely with orange juice. Make sure it is right to the top. There is no vacant space, no empty space at all. Fill it up completely and check again. It is full. The whole glass jar making the human body is full of orange juice. Now, keep your hands in front of you at a comfortable place. So, when the orange juice flows, it does not mess you up. Now, press on the fingers gently so that the orange juice comes drop by drop, not all at once and watch its level go down till the eye level. When it comes to your eyes, stop, slowly, very gradually, not so fast, 
slowly let the orange juice go from the fingertips and watch the level coming down the head. At eye level, stop. Hold. Hold at eye level. Hold. Now press the fingers again and let the orange juice come up to the level of the tip of the nose and same level behind and hold slowly, very gradually. Now press the valves in the fingertips again to let the orange juice come down to the level of the lips, the mouth and hold. Now press the fingertips again, valves open to let it go down to the throat. When it comes to the throat, hold. Now let the uh, orange juice flow again through the tips of the fingers. When it comes to the shoulder, hold. Press the fingers, open the valves till the orange juice comes to the armpits, to the middle of the chest and hold there. Now watch the two arms separately. We will first operate the right side, the right arm. Do not touch the left finger, only the finger of the right hand. Press them so that the orange juice of the right arm flows up to the elbow. When it reaches the elbow, stop and hold slowly, very gradually. Now go to the left side in the left arm. Open the left fingers, the valves of the left fingers, press them so they open and allow the orange juice in the left arm to flow till the elbow level, the same level as on the right. And when it comes to the elbow level, stop. Now open the fingers on both hands to completely empty out the arms of orange juice. Open the valves on both the fingers of both the hands and let the orange juice go. Let it fall out. Don't worry of the speed now. Let it go. Empty out the hands. Empty the arms, shake the arms a little if any drops are still sticking. Now go back and look at the rest of the body and see the torso is still full. Now press upon the toes to open the valves in the feet and allow the orange juice to flow out up to your heart level and stop wherever you feel is your heart level. You may be close to it. Just stop for a while. Open the valves in the feet and allow the orange juice to go down to the waist, to the navel level, in the middle of the abdomen. See if that's the level and hold it there, very slowly now, gradually. Now press the feet and let the orange juice go down and empty the torso up to the top of the legs so that the orange juice is only in the legs, the rest of the body is emptied out and hold it there. Hold. Now put your attention on the right leg, press the feet to vacate the orange juice in the top part of the thigh up to the knees. When it reaches the right knee, stop and hold the orange juice there in the lower right leg, slowly. Now switch over to the left leg and open the valves in the feet and let the orange juice go down to the knee of the left leg and hold it there. Now open the valves of both feet and allow the orange juice to flow out from the rest of the legs and the feet. Open them fully. Also open the valves of the hand to see if any last drops are there. Let all the orange juice flow out. Look over the whole body that there is no orange juice left. Shake that part of the body where you still find some drops sticking. Shake your hands and feet so that the entire orange juice flows out. Make sure all orange juice is out. Keep your eyes closed till I count five. One, two, three, four, five. Open your eyes and look this side. Come back. How many of you were able to imagine you are made of glass? Raise your hand. How many of you have had difficulty imagining you were made of glass? How many of you were able to fill yourself up with orange juice? Raise your hand. How many of you had difficulty filling yourself with orange juice at all? How many of you had filled up with orange juice but couldn't fill it up completely? 
Anybody here? When I said start draining it, how many of you were able to stop at the eye level? How many of you could not stop at the eye level? How many of you could stop at the nose? How many could not stop at the nose? How many could not stop at the lips? How many could not stop at will whenever the direction was given? How many could stop at all the levels that I mentioned? Raise your hand. Thank you. Generally, the experiment was successful. How many were able to completely empty the body of orange juice? How many had to shake it to get the last drops off? Okay, lot of them. How many failed to get the body completely off? You couldn't completely, some drops are still sticking at the end. How many of you remember what were the parts of the body where the orange juice would stick and not go? How many of you remember? Thank you. Do you associate that part with some physical problem that you have? I have conducted this experiment for many years now in many groups. And one thing I found which is very common is that most of the people who had the this uh, experience of not being able to drip the orange juice at will found it difficult to shake it off from that part of the body where there was a problem, sometimes a potential problem. So, a simple exercise like that gave them a clue what to take care of in their bodies. Of course, that was not the main purpose of this exercise. It is a incidental perk, what is it, a, a side benefit that one can get from this exercise. The main purpose was to be able to move your attention, to be conscious of different parts of the body at will and at an instruction to move from there to somewhere else, not involuntarily. This voluntary movement of consciousness through the form of attention on different parts of the body is helpful when we want to withdraw attention to ourselves and we get some control on the flow of attention. This exercise helps us to get control over the flow of attention. Otherwise, our lives are such that attention is flowing involuntarily. Somebody or the other is pulling us out all the time. In the next exercise, which we will now undertake, we will see if somebody pulls at us all the time or not. This next exercise tests the effect of our attachment upon our power to withdraw attention. In this exercise, we stay at the third eye center. We withdraw and sit on the comfortable chair, ignore the table, no more puddings and no more feasts and no more flowers. Now we get down to the real business. We go sit on the chair and watch the screen in front of us, the darkness, the blackness, just watch. Without leaving the chair, we see what comes in front. We watch the screen in front and see what images come in front. We do not try to engineer any images. We do not try to think of anything. Whatever comes, comes and we let it go and let it pass. Similarly, we allow, we give a free choice to the mind to think what it wants to think. Any thoughts that come, we listen to the thoughts and let them pass. So, we listen to the thoughts and see the images of memory that come in front of us and stay in our chair and do nothing but watch. We are now going to be witnesses of what happens in front of us. We are going to be seeing and hearing our own mind at work. In this exercise, we have to do nothing but watch and listen. But do not leave the chair. Also, I would like to now mention at this stage that do not put the chair below the eye level. Do not let the chair sink down because when that happens, especially at this part of the exercise, we go to sleep. I do not know if anybody has felt so far. Did anybody have a tendency to sleep? Okay. Now, I must caution you, the next part, the tendency will be great unless you can keep awake and so long as your attention is at the eye level or above, you will not go to sleep. But when you allow your chair to sink below, the tendency will be to go to sleep. So, when you start the exercise, make sure that the floor on which the chair is placed at the eye level is a strong floor reinforced with steel and cement. 
And how do you test it? You can't analyze the floor, but thump upon it. Make sure that this is strong enough and your chair will not sink. So once you're sure that your floor is at the eye level, and you're sitting on the chair on that behind the eyes, then just watch what happens in front. Don't follow it. Any questions? You have to have a platform. So you don't go down. Otherwise, you go to sleep. If you can keep there without a platform, fine. But don't go down. The platform is merely a device to stay awake. No other purpose. If you can stay awake without the platform, forget the platform. Just be there. Be conscious of the eyes and that you are behind at that level. That's enough. Okay, we'll start this exercise then. Take your comfortable meditative position. Keep your hands comfortably in such a way they don't distract you. Your legs, your feet, in the most comfortable meditative position that you can secure. Sit upright, close your eyes and pull yourself back to the third eye center. Imagine you are sitting in the center of the head. If your mind says anything, listen to it. But don't follow it. Listen and leave it. Let it think something else. Then listen to that and forget it. Smile. Even if it says foolish things, smile. Even stupid thoughts, just smile. Don't frown. Whatever comes in front, let it pass. If nothing comes, look at the darkness in front and listen to the mind. Don't imagine any thoughts. Just imagine you are sitting in the center of the head. If any lights come, any colors come, just look at them but don't follow them. If any sounds come, just listen to them but don't follow. Don't leave the center. Stay in the center. Stay awake, behind the eyes, in the center. Don't run after anything. Let them come and go. Stay in the center. Keep your eyes closed till I count five. One, two, three, four, five. Open your eyes. Look at this side. Look this side. Open your eyes. Welcome back. How many of you felt that you were able to stay in the center during this exercise? Raise your hand. Thank you. How many of you had difficulty locating the center and being there? Any questions at this point? Yes. So you are looking at different places or were you moving? Looking is all right. One should not move. As we withdraw attention, this was a very short exercise. We need a much longer time for this exercise to evolve into the possibilities of the sights and sounds one can see by withdrawal. But you see lots of sights and sounds, very beautiful colors, very beautiful things. But you have to sit longer than that. I have a restriction on the time I have for the workshop. So I'll press on. But you try this on your own also and see the effect of just being by yourself and not moving from the center. If you are seeing something beautiful and you go after it and move from the center, that disappears. It is not coming and then you are pulled to it. It is your being in the center, withdrawal that is bringing it up. Remember that. So don't move from the center. Yes. Well, this is a difficulty which others might have had that instead of being the image sitting in the center, you start looking at a figure of yourself sitting in the center. How many of you saw a figure sitting there instead of being there yourself? You know you have to you have to be there rather than see yourself. Yes. So the suggestion he is making is that when you try to imagine you are a person in a certain form, the tendency is to start seeing that form. And the form you see is in front of you. Therefore you are not there. Supposing you figure out this is the third eye center and there I am seeing myself sitting on the chair, then you are seeing what is in front of you. Then where are you? Just behind that. If this happens, apart from the suggestion he has given, I will give you another suggestion. If this happens, that instead of experiencing that you are there, you begin to see a little one of you sitting there which you imagined, you 
pull that little one away and take the chair to yourself where you are watching that little one from. Because that's where you really are. And that is the third eye center. The figure you make in front is just in front of that. So you have to pull back to where you are looking at from rather than what you are seeing. That is not the point. The point is where you are, not what you are looking at. If it vacillates and you have a choice, lock in to the bass sound, not to the high-pitched one. The high-pitched is actually an earlier stage than the other one. So when it vacillates between the two and you can lock in, lock in with the bass one. Just listen to it till it rings. But don't move from the center. If you stay in the center, it will ring more. Yeah, a lot of people have gone to doctors for that. <laughs> I went to one of the Spiritual Frontier Fellowship workshops there, and there was another speaker who spoke uh, earlier, and we were in an adjacent room. So I spoke later on about the sound. In the middle of the night, he says, I thought this was wrong. I've been going to doctors. There's something really wrong with my eardrum and they find nothing wrong and I keep on hearing the sound. I said, you lucky fellow, keep on hearing. <laughs> but, but don't hear and run. Hear and sit there, stay there. You'll hear more. What happens is, when we hear, we try to run after where we are hearing. It goes away. The sound is not coming because we are approaching it. The sound is coming because we are approaching our own self. The more we center ourselves, the more these bells will ring. It's the centering that is creating it. Okay, what about thoughts? Did you hear your own thoughts? Did anybody find one's thoughts can be stupid? You raise your hand. Oh, good. Me too. <clears throat> Did you find thoughts that take you back to things outside? Family, friends, things, places. How many of you had that experience? Did you feel when you were in this exercise that these are the thoughts that are taking you away from the center? The truth is, these are the most powerful distractants. The greatest distraction to centering are thoughts that take you out. And many of them are arising from attachment. The more attached we are, the more the distraction. Should we be detached? How many of you think it's unfair to our families to become detached? Would I suggest that it is better to have love than attachment? How about that as a compromise? That let's have detachment, no attachment, but let's have love as a substitute for attachment. What's the difference? The difference between attachment and love is attachment involves ego. I love you. Attachment. Why don't you do when I do so much for you? Attachment. Oh, he let me down so badly. Attachment. I had great expectations. I loved so much, but look what happened. Attachment. Although the word love is being used, there is no love in any of these instances. What is love? I care so much, I forget myself. When I care so much, the I disappears, that love. Where the I is strengthened in the relationship, it's attachment. Where the I disappears and the you, the beloved remains, is love. Love is a very good substitute on the spiritual path for attachment. For attachment, use love and you will have much better meditation. Okay, now these thoughts that came many of them from attachments, many from day-to-day -day activities. Is there any way to control these thoughts? Did any one of you try to control the thought? Yes, the mantra. Did anybody else try to control thoughts with mantra? Okay, that's good. That is the answer which the mystics have given. That till you can develop a personality that's full of love and not attachment. Love with detachment. Till you can have that personality, use repetition of words as a means to stop the distraction of thought. That is how the mantra came up in the first place. The repetition of words is used in meditation 
primarily to overcome the distractions of the thinking mind, which thinks in words. When you put in other words, the intention is to squeeze out the words of thought by pumping in the words of mantra. The same channel which occupies the space of thought, the same channel can be made to occupy the words of mantra. How many of you know any mantra or any words of mantra? Please raise your hand. How many of you know no mantra? Okay. Now, those of you who don't know any mantra, can you coin a mantra? Make an improvised one for today. How to make an improvised mantra is to make a short statement about love for somebody. Just a short statement expressing love for somebody. All of you make the statement who have no mantra. The rest, use your mantra that you know. In the next exercise, we are going to use it. In the next exercise, we are going to go back there and this time not listen to the mind. We will sit in the center using the mantra as a constant repetition to block the mind. To block the mind from interfering with our presence there. And as we sit there and repeat the mantra, we will watch what happens. If any light or sound or, uh, or color or beauty comes up, we will watch. We will watch from the distance of our own center. Not go towards it. Not move right or left. Stay there and keep on repeating the mantra in order to control the thoughts that distract us. Remember, the thoughts can be very powerful. Have you ever tried a mantra and while you are repeating the mantra, the mind says, aren't you doing it too fast? <laughs> in fact, it can happen in more than one layer. You can have two layers doing mantra repetitions. The third one thinks. The one who was able to identify. Many great yogis have been able to look into their minds in meditation and see five levels, five channels of the thinking mind. One superseding the other. The Dalai Lama. You heard of the Dalai Lama, the Nobel Peace Prize winner? The Dalai Lama and I, we shared this when we were together in Dharamsala. And he was able to see eight levels of the thinking mind. And in meditation, he used to do meditation for long hours. So, to be able to overcome the problem of the thinking mind going into another channel, use a mantra in every channel you recognize. That means, while you are repeating the mantra, first of all, repeat it deliberately. Not supposing the mantra is one to three, one to three, one to three, one to three. Not like that. One, two, three. Say it so deliberately, it occupies the space in the mind. The mantra must push the thoughts out. If you find in the middle while you are one, two, three, somebody saying, what's that nonsense? Don't try to push that out. Convert it into its own voice. One, two, three, and the second voice saying, one, two, three, with it. Two people doing mantra. If you find an image coming in front of you, somebody, some relative of yours, some spouse, some daughter, father, mother, son, some friend, somebody's image comes and starts talking to you. Don't try to push the image away. Make that person say, come on, join in the mantra. Whether you see an image or hear a sound, put them all in a chorus of mantra. A chorus, everything that should be in the head should be repeating the mantra at the same deliberative pace. At the same pace and so deliberative, so loud if necessary inside, not with this mouth, not with this tongue, so loud inside, you do not allow any thought to get it, except the sound of the mantra. Are you ready for it? Any questions? You have the image in the third eye center of yourself being there. That is necessary for all this. We are moving one step more each time. Third eye center. Go back to the third eye center behind the eyes. Sit in your comfortable chair or be there without a chair if you like. And start repeating the mantra, either the one given to you by a teacher or the one you just coined. And repeat it deliberatively, mechanically, at the same pace, again and again. And every voice that you can hear in your head should repeat the mantra. And every face you can see should repeat the mantra. Now start. Close your eyes and begin. Slowly and deliberately, 
listen to what you are saying listen to the mantra don't say it inaudibly or in such a low tone that you can't even listen to what you are saying pronounce the mantra clearly and listen to it keep on repeating don't leave the center keep awake concentrate on the mantra no other thought don't follow the images let them come and go repeat the mantra stay in the center mantra at the center eye center behind the eyes in the head keep your eyes closed till i count five 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 12 13 14 15 16 17 18 19 20 21 22 23 24 25 Open your eyes. Look this side. Open your eyes. Yeah, in the beginning that happens, but when you are talking to me, the breathing doesn't interfere. When you are eating nice food, the breathing doesn't interfere because we got used to it. It's the same breathing, but when we want to be here, the breathing becomes audible and distracting. But after a while, one gets used to it as a necessary companion. You have to put up with him, ignore. Him. takes time but you ignore it and these people have done exercises with pranayam or with breathing exercises this problem will be there more persistent for a while because breathing is very good as an exercise to take us to the lower chakra it's easy to travel on the breath to go to lower chakras is easy but to hold here the breathing becomes a distraction so put up with it and gradually you will see that although it is there you start ignoring it then it doesn't distract anymore uh how many of you were able to repeat the mantra constantly without interruption thank you how many of you were interrupted in the middle because of other thought because of sleep other thought sleep okay these are the most common interruption other thought and sleep if we can overcome these two we solve the problem of getting these thoughts out which distract us yes the best time to do meditation is before eating to avoid sleep some people have followed having a cold bath i don't know it suits each person individually you have to figure out individually what makes it most conducive for you to withdraw attention to third eye center and avoid the distraction of these thoughts did any one of you during this exercise see anything in front other than the faces of the attachment other than the lights of sound anything yes figures yes you saw the letters flashing in front did any one of you feel during this exercise that there was a general of awakening of awareness that you became aware of some things that are not directly connected with what i am saying anybody had that experience you became aware some answers came which you were not really specifically directing to this happens sometimes that uh, when we are focusing in as we say on an issue which is different from what what comes up the answers can be totally surprising for us we can have an awareness we can have knowledge of things which we did not really intend to pick up if you follow the spiritual path you will find that the offshoot of these exercises is not merely that you can see lights and sounds those are not so important the offshoot is the general raising of awareness and awareness that makes things more clear things that are not even being discussed here but which are questions we have asked for a long time those answers keep coming and they won't come only now they keep coming till we meet again people who have attended previous workshops has anybody had that experience that between the two workshops so much happened which we did not expect to happen yes you want to share something that's a good experience you don't always have to have images images are mostly a distraction we trying to meet these distractions sometimes they are beautiful sometimes they themselves raise our level of 
happiness and awareness. But the real thing is when we feel in a different level of consciousness and can experience the lightness, the lightness of being in that particular level, which is not relatable to the strange pressure on the physical body and the physical system that we are going through here. So, but that happens occasionally. But with practice, that can be achieved at will when you want it. And that's one of the purposes. You do meditation, you go into that. In a fine state, you come out, you're a different person. Till the rest of the world again tries to pull you down and drown you, time to go back to meditation. And if you do it once a day early morning, nobody can pull you down. Good enough. Any other question at this time? Yes. Yes, the right time for meditation varies from individual to individual. There is no set time. Uh, I, can, I think uh, you can go to Spain. They all have a siesta time from 1 o'clock to 4 o'clock. All work stops. All work stops. The all people go into a siesta 1, a, a 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. or 5 p.m. sometimes. Even offices, government offices, even the U.S. consulate closes down. That's the only place it closes down for so long in the afternoon, at so-called working hours. Maybe this, you may have some Spanish background. <laughs> but we have to find by not only our personal preference, but the situation we are in, the work situation, the hours of work, and see which is the best time. The best suggestion I can make in these circumstances is do meditation at all available times in small periods and pick up the best that suits you. Try different periods. I meditate in the early morning for a particular reason. Three o'clock is a good time for me because I am fixed with a certain idea. I can share that with you. Once upon a time, the great master, who is my teacher, he was asked in his headquarters, the Dera in India, he said, Master, you are so powerful, you are like a king, you have all the goodies in your basket, why do you make people sit in meditation, study hard, read books and then you say, come up, why can't you just distribute them freely to people? And he said, yeah, this has occurred to me sometimes. I do carry my basket at 3 o'clock in the morning and I do go to distribute, but I find most of the people are sleeping. Nobody picks them up. I don't want to miss the three o'clock. <laughs> it's my personal feeling. You can pick up your own time. Yes. Well, the, uh, the total period we should give to meditation in any 24 hour period is one tenth. That is two and a half hours. You can divide. It can be three to five thirty or you can split between that time and the evening if you have free time or before sleeping at night. My master's master, Babaji, who is great master's master, he recommended, in addition to the early morning time for meditation, he recommended meditating before sleeping. So that if you meditate at that time, you can sleep into meditation rather than sleep at lower level. And he practiced successfully and he suggested that. That can also, you can try that too. Just before sleeping, half an hour. He suggested half hour at that time. This brings me to the final exercise we are going to do. You will find after all is said and done that the real secret of success on the spiritual path is the intensity of your love, devotion and longing. When you are longing for truth, you are ready for truth, you will get it, all the things will be goodies on your way. There will be no obstruction. When the intensity is weak, when you are out of diffidence trying a new thing because somebody said so, you can try very hard, it doesn't work the same way. So the real secret is how strongly devoted are you? And one of the roles the perfect living master performs as being a master in our life is that we have a focus for love and devotion. Although he brings it back to within ourselves, but while he is a person, a human being, we get a focus to put our love and devotion on. And it's love and devotion that helps us to withdraw and have these experiences faster than anything else. Love and devotion is the highest yoga, the highest meditation. All other meditation will ultimately lead to it. Therefore, 
it's sometimes good to practice the longing devotion expression of love and commitment to somebody if you can express love and commitment to anybody it means something in your spiritual upliftment it means raising levels of consciousness we'll try that now in this exercise we'll go back to the third eye center and use this period not for listening to the mind not for using the mantra but for expression in our own way in our own language in any form how we long for the lord how we long for the darshan of the perfect living master how we long for the beloved how committed are we to the beloved what makes us long for it what happens how intense we are we want to express our intensity of love for the beloved but stay in the third eye center don't do it from outside in the body go back to the third eye center and express your love there in any way you like but it should be expression of love all the way close your eyes and begin stay in the center don't go to sleep keep awake keep your eyes closed till i count 5 1 2 3 4 5 6 open your eyes look this side if you feel good we coming to the close of this workshop i want to leave a few minutes for questions i want to make it clear that this workshop is a preparation is a preparation for the spiritual journey a preparation for going within it gives a clue to what it means by going within which direction we take in our day to day life we know there is a direction outward and there is a direction inward we should not forget that this is the direction we have to take for spiritual knowledge and truth and love this is where the truth resides we have to do our work outside live in this world and never forget the direction of truth not run around searching for truth outside the truth is within us we are here by different circumstances strange coincidences have brought us together sometimes it looks very odd how we have come here but it has all happened because of our inner seeking when we are ready we meet a perfect living master automatically when we are ready we get initiated and when we are ready we go within on the spiritual path when our intensity and longing is strong enough the lord pulls us from within he is inside who whatever your belief may be about the name of the ultimate creator or the name of the lord you can use any name he still resides inside and is only one and when he pulls you he pulls from within he may create circumstances outside including the circumstance of a perfect living master but he is pulling from within so this kind of a workshop the preparation i congratulate you for coming and joining with me and i hope that you will continue to make progress on the spiritual journey that you already started on with the seeking that is already there in your heart i know people have felt the effect of seeking in many ways for one thing the number of coincidences that happen to one person increases as the seeking increases i have seen many people when they were just leading an ordinary human life they never even noticed anything unusual when they began to seek in their heart odd things happened meeting people unexpectedly opening a book at the strange page reading a sign and seeing a different meaning new things started happening which were strange coincidences and all of them were leading to the same thing that you are getting ready for the spiritual path these experiences that happen outside and inside are in a way a measure of our movement on this journey you will as time goes on find that the workshop was not a few hours getting together but goes on as part of life i hope you enjoyed it as much as i did out of the newcomer who came for the first time is there anybody who felt that this was a gratifying experience an experience worthwhile please raise your hands only the newcomers 
Thank you. Old comers, are you still happy? Yeah. Would you care to come to another workshop? Yeah. Oh boy, this didn't do any good. <laughs> <laughs> I, there was a guy in India and his brother was an old disciple of a perfect living master. And this guy from the village had never heard of a master. So he was visiting his brother. The brother said, do you know master is in town? I am going to hear his discourse. Would you like to come? That simpleton from the village, country man, what you call hillbilly? <laughs> we call hillybilly. That person, he came with his brother who was a professor in the college and he went to attend a discourse. When the master started speaking, the master spoke two sentences and this village brother got up, country brother and left. And this man ran after, he said, where are you going? The lecture has just started. He says, what? What he has said takes time to practice. I am going to practice what he has said. I will come back and listen to the rest of it later. Some of us listen to long discourses. From one year, they go out from the other year, we are still the same. And some find even one sentence so important. They say it's worthwhile practicing what we have heard. Then we come back for more. The point is, this is a path of practice. Not of merely listening and leaving it in the lecture hall, but carrying it with us for practice in our lives. If we practice in our life, then only we get the benefits. I would like to leave a few minutes for questions if you have any. Yes, it's very common. As the practice of mantra grows, the insights, intuitive insights and opening up of answers to questions increases automatically. It's very common. Yes. You like the light side, humorous side, and not the sobering side. Well, uh, uh, one thing I have noticed in these masters, this is my personal observation, I have met many masters even perfect, at least four or five perfect living masters I've met in my life. And one thing I've found is, they have a strong sense of humor. They sometimes make a very, very serious, sober, sombering thing into something lighthearted, so we can absorb it. So I think uh, the eight senses, which I re refer to frequently, out of eight senses, the eighth is very important. You know about the eight senses. The five are the senses of perception which we dealt with earlier, seeing, hearing, touching, tasting, smelling. Then there is a sixth sense which is called sixth sense, the intuition, which we just know without knowing how. And the seventh sense is common sense which is very uncommon, <laughs> which helps us to know what is important, what is not, helps to differentiate between the chaff and the grain. But the eighth sense is the most important, the sense of humor, the ability to laugh the ability to be amused, the ability to smile at creation, the ability to look from the top and see what the world is like. Sense of humor. So sense of humor is very important. And if it is uh, too serious and dry, we have a problem. Yes, there is a real initiation and there is a formal initiation. The real initiation is when the master becomes your master and links you up within. You may not even know it. The formal initiation is when he formally accepts you as a disciple, teaches you the mantra the, for repetition and simran, teaches you how to more appropriately hear the inner sound and gives you guidelines how to avoid the negativity of the mind and other negative forces that may be around you. Yes, we can try. But the people who want to pollute seem to be in a majority. And although those who want to clean up the atmosphere are very keen and earnest to do it, the pollutants have got a strange motive. They make money out of it. Those who are polluting the planet are doing it in a mercenary way. They are making money out of it. They are making business out of it. Their business depends upon partly polluting the environment. And when people are so much materialistic and they want to get money, they want to get money is God for them. They want to get that at any cost. They don't care for pollu pollution. So what has happened is that a minority group is working to clean up the atmosphere 
and the rest are saying, no, let's pollute and we'll tell you how to live clean. So what is happening is the technology is moving towards providing clean environmental place for individual human beings to live in while polluting the planet. We have been doing it for years and in the next century we are going to keep doing it. This technology, this is the price we are paying for technology. We will be able to live in absolutely beautiful environment, clean air, everything. And if we peep out of our habitats, we will find such immense pollution, we won't even have the immunity to stand it. This is going to happen in the next 20, 30 years. But it is still good to keep the awareness alive that we want clean planet. If we fail, it's not because we fail because of intentions, we are failing because of the overpowering effect of materialism, overpowering effect of making money at any cost, which is gripping people in this world. This is the Kali Yuga, Iron Age. And when the air changes and people change their values, of course they will say, oh, what damage we did to our planet, this was like a person like us, we should have treated it better and they may start all over again. But that is how the history tells us we have do been doing with this planet and other planets in the past. We have moved from one phase to another. In this iron age, we have always been so destructive of the planet. That is what we are witnessing now. But do not give up the good cause. The cause still remains good even if we fail. Yes. What is a, an example of a good mantra? There was an American seeker who heard that one of the sadhus living on the Himalayan mountains had found the ultimate mantra that when you repeat those words, you can definitely go to a higher level of consciousness. Sure, no failures. He said, that's the kind of thing I was looking for. So he took the next plane to India, had the long route to the mountains, went up to Himalayas, and he found that sadhu near the cave. And he said, Master, I heard you have a special mantra. When we use those words, it is inevitable that we go to higher level of consciousness. Master said, of course I have it. Said, Will you give it to me? I have come after such a long travel and from the other side of the world, 10,000 miles. He said, yes, certainly I will give you the mantra. So he said, what is the mantra? So he went close to him and that sadhu utter these words, he says, repeat these words in a quiet corner, abracadabra. He says, what? Is this what I came to listen? He says, no, there is a condition. When you say abracadabra, don't think of bananas. <laughs> the man tried for years. Every time he just started abracadabra, the bananas would come. Uh, the sadhu gave a message in a very strange way. It's not the words. It's our capacity to get out of the words. Therefore, the words are not the real thing. The real thing is what we can do with our mind. But I might tell you here, the words which a perfect living master are normally such which have no association of ideas with our day-to-day -day life. If they have, then every time we are meditating, our mind will go to those things. So more appropriately, we might choose some odd Greek or Sanskrit words. So we don't know. We keep on repeating them for their sound and not for their association in our life. One characteristic. Second characteristic, since they are words, they must have some association of idea. The master, especially the perfect living master, Make sure that those words have an association of ideas at a higher level where he and we are the same. So that when we go within, we find that those words which meant nothing in the physical world were actually our own words. We can pick up those words too. Thirdly, a perfect living master who comes from the true region is a first guru, the unity. If he gives words specially selected for any individual, and they need not be the same words, if he states certain words, he puts his association from the spiritual side into those words 
and those words become protective. And we can try the words of mantra given by a perfect living master. They are so protective. While repeating them, nothing negative can happen. We have even seen while repeating them, the mind cannot play any game. And that's great benefit. So if one can get mantra of that kind, it's highly desirable and very useful. But a perfect living master will give such a mantra when he is formally initiating us. Let's wait for it. Yes, last question. Well, sometimes you see me doing this. I sometimes stay here and listen to you. Sometimes I walk here and listen to you. Don't do this. Learn from my experience. Stay behind the podium. Which in the case of the spiritual practice is behind the eyes. Stay there and listen. When you go towards it, it doesn't go on. The sound modifies. Because we are so used to a sound being a source and we can go to it that we try the same thing there. The truth is, the sound comes to us when we are at the center. The more we hold on to the center, the more this sound comes to us. So we shouldn't leave the center. That is the secret of good meditation. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Friends, I was really happy. Thank you. Thank you very much. See you again.